Big O Tires is rolling out Black Friday deals now through December 8. Get limited time Black Friday savings on oil changes, brakes, car batteries, and more. Plus, save up to $190 on select Michelin and BF Goodrich tires when you use your Big O Tires card. With no interest financing for 12 full months OAC. Don't miss Black Friday deals happening now through December 8th only at Big O Tires. For your nearest participating location, go to BigOtires.com. Hey, what's up? Blair, I'm, I'm well. I'm fresh back from Mexico City, as you know. Um, yeah. And uh, better off for it. Better off for having gone. Better off for being home. We're going to talk more about that tomorrow at Big O Tires in, in Lee Summit about the Mexico trip uh, to see the Chiefs beat the, the L.A. Chargers. Hey, but before we go on, I should say this is Sports Beat KC presented by Big O Tires. It's the Stars Daily Sports Podcast. It's Wednesday, November 20th. And Vahe Gregorian is with me, and you and I are here to talk about this cool book that is, uh, that's been out for a little while now, a few weeks. It is called 69 Chiefs, that's as, as in 1969, 69 Chiefs, A Team, A Season, and the Birth of Modern Kansas City. You know, Vahe, one of the neat things that you and I get to do in our business is um, hang out with some cool authors, <laughs> and Michael McCambridge is a pretty cool dude, and I, I I've, I've glanced at the book. I haven't I haven't finished it, but man, I'm looking forward to getting into it in a big way. You, you you'll you'll love it, and and uh, really anybody that follows the Chiefs um, in in any kind of just even remotely interested way would love it because actually, as is mentioned in the title, the way it brings all these things together, right? It, what it meant to Kansas City, what it meant to the region, that time in our country and Kansas City. And the monumental event in itself. Um, Michael, I, I go way back with Michael. We both lived in St. Louis at the same time. And um, I first read him when he did the book, The Franchise, about Sports Illustrated. And in addition to his just keen insights and, and eloquent writing is the thoroughness. And the, that book he interviewed, I think, 350 people for he may have interviewed fewer for this one. I'm not sure. But uh, this will read as if it's uh, uh, just the definitive statement on on the 69 Chiefs. Well, two players we know he interviewed were Willie Lanier and Jan Stenerud. And you were the moderator of a discussion at uh, Unity Temple on the Plaza. Uh, it was a Rainy Day Books event, author event. And that is what you're going to hear on today's podcast, uh, the, the, um, the, the event. We, we've got it. We recorded it. Now, you'll also hear a lot of things in this recording, in addition to Vahe moderating the event and Michael McCambridge, joined by Chiefs Jan Stenerud and, and Willie Lanier, both NFL Hall of Famers. You'll also hear some, uh, some laughing, some coughing, some sneezing, some cell phone uh, ringing, and just uh, listen. We had we enhanced the audio. We we it's we think we think it's fine, and uh, we hope you enjoy it because it's it was quite a enjoyable afternoon. It was actually taped, or this event happened on October 27th on a Sunday afternoon, the day of the evening game between the the Chiefs and the Green Bay Packers. And look, one of the things we endeavor to do in our business is take you where you can't go. And so all, for every cough, every laugh that you hear, I think you'll feel more like you were there. <laughs> That's right. I think I was doing some of the coughing <laughs> in, there, in that. But I'll tell you what was great about that. You, you did a wonderful job moderating the, the event. And you got, uh, you got some, these guys to tell some great stories. I remember Jan Stenerud speaking to the condition of the playing field. It was even worse than he thought it was going to be that day on Super Bowl four at Tulane Stadium. And Willie Lanier was just fantastic, talking about how he felt he needed to establish himself on this team in in the uh, late 1960s. Um, and I'll, I'll let I'll let you listen to it. I'll let the let, let the audience listen to it. But I was struck by what he said and how he related it to this year's team. I've read these sorts of things about Willie over the years. I've read um, his words on some of these things before. But I but I thought. 
um, seeing him in person, and, and as uh, our audience will now hear it here, um, it, it is really striking, both in um, the substance, but also how he speaks to it. He's got a really kind of beautiful cadence, um, and it's, I think, kind of riveting listening. And I'll, I'll say this just finally about the conversation, because I want you guys to hear it. Um, it ended with a Q&A session, and there was a pretty nice discussion about Otis Taylor's chance of getting into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I know that's always a, a popular topic here in Kansas City, and I think you might be surprised at what our panelists had to say about that. So um, so let's listen to it. And before we do, I want to thank our producers, Derek Donovan and Leah Becerra, for their efforts in putting together today's episode. And as I said earlier, we will be back on Thursday with another Sports Beat KC, which will originate from Big O Tires as a Facebook Live. Here you go. I do wonder, Willie, if we could start with you, what, what do you think of when you think of that day, both in terms of the specifics on the field and maybe what it meant in your life? Well, we've had a chance to, I think, watch them about uh, three, two months ago. And it reflects on the growth of the league, how the game has changed, the reality of the life of them. So you see so many individuals in that film who pass at different points along the way. So you're very thankful that you, Jan, myself, and all of you could be here today to be able to reflect on that. It just shows the growth of the game, the fact that the team played tonight, or Chief played Green Bay in the first ball, and all that has changed. And none of us could have thought that this game could have grown as immensely as it has grown. Because it's still just a game played on a 50 yard field, 100 yards long, 11 people on both sides. But that being said, it has become much more advanced than that and takes on its own life force as tonight will be in all the games during the course of the year. John, uh, really made reference to the uh, uh, dimensions of the field which might be as we were watching those clips. Of course, at that time, the goalposts were at the goal line. And after that game, Carl Eller suggested you were the MVP of the Super Bowl because once the Chiefs crossed the 50-yard line, you were going to score because John Stenner was going to take a field goal. It didn't look like very good conditions that day, though. Was that a factor at all for you? When I was watching that game. I do remember having mud things on my left heel because footing is so important when you kick. And I was really concerned. And I think I, when he saw the field, it was really worse than what I remember. <laughs> that, that being the Super Bowl, they had a tar on the field. It, there's several holes in it, and quite a few holes, I think. The way it uh, so that was a problem. But the cleats, the cleats held up the, uh, because all my uh, field work takes work from the you know, muddy part of the field. Um, See, Willie and I, we looked at, we talked about people that has died, and I was in the end of the clip there. Some of my, Jerry Mays, Buck Dickin, and Aaron Brown, they were three or the four in defense of mine. Curry was the fourth. And that died a long time ago, and they were really my heroes when I came here. <laughs> Willie and I were rookies in 1967 together. <laughs> Willie became the, maybe the greatest linebacker in the profit, the middle linebacker. Was the first black middle linebacker. That was a big deal at that time. Uh, I came at a good time because the league had just expanded a couple of years before to 40 people instead of 38, then it was 35, 33 people. So I could actually make room for a kick when they couldn't do anything else to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so the timing was right. But, I, uh, but even in those days, even though the game has progressed, television has made such a big difference, but it was a really big deal. Uh, the articles from the papers have at home now are kind of yellowish, some of them from 50 years ago, but there were uh, 70 million people in America watching the game. The population was 225 million. Now you're talking about over 100 million watching the game. The population is 325 million. So the percentage was about the same. I think I remember reading also that the, the water usage during the halftime in Kansas City, that particular halftime, that lasted about half an hour, I think. Uh, we almost ran out of water because we went to the restroom at the halftime. <laughs> Everybody was watching the game. But looking back, well, it, it, was a, it was a fabulous team. Uh, I remember I was so, there was a guy on the sideline that kept bugging me. He wanted a warm up jacket. 
And uh, she said, can I have the jacket after the game? I said, well, it wasn't. I think it happened. It's very important to be on the sideline. But I remember I was so intense in trying to do, even though in those days, the center played, he snapped the ball in field goals. Quarterback was the whole but it was all warm-up dance. So what I did on the sideline was staying around and trying to stay warm, but it's not what I really did except for trying to concentrate really hard on what at least I could do my job the best, I, best of my ability. It turned out after the game that guy was a guy called Pat O'Brien. He played he played he did rock me and went home for the game. So I finally figured out who that guy was. That was a long answer for a pretty short question. <laughs> short question. Anyway, I've enjoyed well this friendship for 50 years. Great, great player, great, great friend, and he had an awful lot to do with the success of our teams in the late 60s and early 70s. And also, the Kansas City Chiefs fans, the big guy here, the Chiefs have made the Super Bowl one, although they lost. The town was on fire like it is today. We came in at a good time. Which you just spoke to this a little bit beyond, but I, I, I've always been struck by the friendships that you all maintained. Um, so many of you show up at, at the Pro Football Hall of Fame every year, of course, because you're in it. Um, but really, the first time I met you was at uh, Bobby Bell's college graduation from the University of Minnesota when Bobby was 78 years old, or something along those lines. And I do wonder, as we think about this, uh, how much those bonds uh, made a difference on your football team. Uh, you guys were unusually close uh, across a lot of different sorts of lines. I, I wonder if that, if that was part of what made you champions. I think the uniqueness of sport is that what it does is combine people together from backgrounds from across the world. That's Norway, as far as you know. <laughs> so Bobby Bell, who graduated with his degree from the University of Minnesota two years ago in 76, his father, whose name was Pink, they grew up, nicknamed Pink, grew up in Sheldon, North Carolina. Segregation was what segregation was at that time. Bobby had the opportunity to go to the University of Minnesota. 1959, his father gave him a watch and wanted his son to graduate from college. So there's many of us who came from the start of black colleges with opportunities to not be able to the National Football League. The American Football League started giving us opportunity. So the reality of opportunity or diversity or legacy is what diversity can do is to make things better. It's to offer opportunity for others to do it to go forward. So all of that became pieces of this unique puzzle that still has a chance to show America how to be better, how to have people from different places, time, and origin, work in a different manner across political spectrum. We at that time had individuals who were white from the South, and Mr. Wallace was down there then, I would say. We have others from the East to West who were from the Black colleges, we might have a little bit more stern view. You had Black Panther down in the West Coast. So you have all these philosophical realities, but what occurred is that once you showed up here, you had to understand that what we try to do is get to read. Whatever your philosophies were, whatever things you want to be a part of your journey, we appreciate who you are, but we believe that at the door. We are after something that's going to last as we sit here this afternoon. 50 years later, we still have to know. So obviously, we understood how to get things done in the midst of change that occurred then and still needs to occur now. It makes me think of uh, Michael, why, why you took such interest in this topic. Um, and what, what, what inspired you, other than the obvious, what inspired you to, to tell this tale? I think it was the 69 Chiefs were a historically significant team for some of the reasons that Willie alluded to. First pro football team in history in which a majority of the starters were African American. Um, and the team had such an extraordinary story. And it felt as though this year, the 50th anniversary, was going to be the last chance to tell that story at a time when people were going to be prepared to hear it, at a time when most of the team was still around to talk about it. And I had, I had tried several years ago to, to persuade a New York publisher to do a full-length history of the team. 
and do one of the, the long tomes that I that I uh, tend to write. Um, and it's it was a Midwestern team that won only one Super Bowl, and there just wasn't enough interest then to justify it. So um, a couple of years ago, I, I just thought this is this is it. We've got to do this. And the good people at Andrews McNeil were willing to do it. And the great photographer Rod Hanna had all these pictures in a safe deposit box in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. And I reached out to him and, and he was he was willing to share his photographs and be part of the project. And I think that um, I looked at this in the book. Any city is going to embrace a champion, right? That's that's just the way sports works. But there was something particularly significant about this team, um, its integration, its diversity, its innovation under Hank Strand, succeeding at this point in time, at a time of such um, civil unrest and racial strife in the country. And I, I do think Willie is right. It, it set an example, not just, um, not just in sports, but in the culture at large, of people from different backgrounds coming and working together. And I, you know, the, the people who would criticize sports say, oh, it's not that simple out there in the real world. And true enough, there's a different set of circumstances and challenges in the real world. But I also think it's true that the example set in sports can change attitudes. Um, one of the things I wrote about in America's Game was that people in Boston who might not be able to hear Martin Luther King Jr. could still learn to respect Bill Russell. People in Cleveland who couldn't abide Malcolm X might learn to respect Jim Brown. And in that way, have their consciousness raised to a certain level. And in the end, it doesn't matter how you get there as long as you get there. And I just thought the 69 Chiefs was a great story of athletic triumph, a great cultural story, um, and I knew this was the last chance to do it. So, another long answer. You mentioned Hank Stram just now, and, and you see the image of Hank Stram um, on the cover of the book. We have sort of the enduring image at the end of the film. Um, and I, I feel it would be interesting for everybody to hear everybody's perspectives from up here about Hank. Um, and Michael, we'll finish with you, but I, I want you to, when you do start, I want you to discuss what he's holding in his hand there and, and how that um, how that speaks to his overall persona. Jan, I remember you telling me about coming here in 1967 and working out at Slope Park, and your holder was Hank Strand, which always made me think about picturing Andy Reid holding for Tyra Santos and Harrison Butker, just sort of a different era. Uh, but, I, but, but Hank, <laughs> Hank uh, had a lot to do with you being here. And I guess I was drafted by Kojar uh, McKeek one year in college. And I was a ski around, and I'm not going to tell you how many did the front post a lot. That's another story. But uh, what, what happened was I kicked a 59 yard field goal after a season. It took us a week to find out that I broke the pro record by three yards and the college record by five yards. <laughs> and then a few weeks later, I get a telegram. And my name addressed the Mount Hennessy State University Athletic Department. Congratulations, you've been drafted in the third round of the AFL Redshirt Draft. Oh. Took me a while to figure out exactly what that meant. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, it, what it meant was that I could, I could actually stay in college one more full quarter because the coach wanted to convince me, or he, he wanted me on the team that was one thing, I'm sure, but also I also had a chance to get drafted by the NFL, which I did at the end of the graduated the next quarter, the next fall quarter. And the NFL, the special draft, was on 30 of us, and we drafted as AFL future draft choices. And I was the first one to And I was thinking back right now. But in the meantime, I had Bobby Bethard, who came out this evening, Tom Bradford, and Tommy O'Boy, a great head of personnel in those days. And I met Hank Strain, and uh, they flew me to a game in uh, Orange Bowl to, to watch them play the last regular season game in 1966 before Super Bowl one, and I made up my mind so I could draft it. I am not going to kick in front of Hank because my stock is bound to go down because I think I'm pretty good. 
They were all contents. They found me and he had me out there kicking right away. He found me. Uh, but anyway, after meeting him, most of the morning, there was no question at all where I wanted to go. I wanted to become the Kansas City Chief in the first place because, and then Hank, when I, before training camp in 1967, he came out to practice when I was kicking. And then they did it. They got half a dozen of patients. He wanted the highest points for that body. Then. So he wanted to see how uh, man, because he wasn't the right hand from the middle, from the left, or distances. Or, and so if, if, if I had a bad day practicing, he would try to figure out what the cost that so he could understand the, the, the swing of picking football. So he was pretty interested in that. He wanted to learn something also to help me as I progress in my kicking career. But I, I, I always enjoyed Hank. Uh, he could be difficult at times. He was uh, he was the uh, the mentor. There's no question about that. But I, I cared for him a lot, and I did exactly what he asked me to do. Never questioned him. Sometimes we wanted a little bit, uh, but we I what he wanted to do. That, I tried to do it. I uh, I really got to, to like him a lot. Talked to him a lot after football, um, and uh, Hankstrand was a very important. Part of maybe the most important part of the Chiefs winning the Super Bowl. Willie, what, what, what was the impact of Hank on your life and what, what do you remember most about him? It was somewhat interesting because of the reality that I spoke about with race being what it was, segregation being what it was, the high energy people that you tend to clash. And so with that, we got along well, but we clashed. I clashed with a lot of people at that time, <laughs> the reality that I saw. But also, I was a graduate of Morgan State University. The important thing to me was to graduate from college so I can go eyeball to eyeball to be equal with anybody. So it became a, a reality that it was important for me to appreciate what skills you have, but you mustn't appreciate the ones I have. And it gives an audience an example. In 1967, with a business degree from Oregon State College, that first September, I was at New York KC in this city, working on the MBA. And I had a hand injury, I had to take an incomplete. But that's just showing the process that you had, that others might not have had. And the thing that happened with Hank and Jan in the office was that was his milieu. He enjoyed that. He didn't do much with defense. So with defense, we had a Tom Craig, we had uh, Tom Dennis, and you had other guys who worked with you uh, to, to mold and model. So Hank, with his mind, created as much of a moving part from an offensive standpoint, something called a stand from a defense standpoint. We could play a 3 4 4 3. We could play a zone on one side of the field, man down the other. We kept the same 11 people on the field for the whole game. We could take away almost anything. And any time that there was a play that worked, it wasn't working again because we would make the adjustments. So the whole joy was seeing the quality of people's minds that came to this thing, which is the game that both of you will see this evening. And I know I and none of others and we will hope they can be somewhat better because in our view the game is as complex as people may appear to be. It's just become one of understanding how to reach for excellence and how to do it in very minute sample size on the team. You can see why I enjoy talking with William. We had a lot of good conversation over the years because it's a very special man. Michael, just your 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 thoughts on on Hank, and, and I'm sorry to nudge you so much towards that hold up thing in his hand, but what would you tell about that? Hank was obsessive. You know, all football coaches are obsessive, um, and Hank particularly so. Um, Len Dawson has spoken about when Hank would go into restaurants, they, they put out they put out paper napkins instead of cloth napkins because Hank would be scrawling plays on napkins. Um, I talked to a, a few of his assistants when I was working on this book, and one of the things that I can remember being curious about when I was growing up is Hank had the rolled up game plan in his hands and he was always moving around. But I asked a few of the assistants, I said, I never seen him looking at the game plan. And the assistant said, um, no, no, that was just more of a prop, you know, because when he had, when he had the game plan, forgive me. 
When he had the big plan, he would just be pointing. It was almost like a conductor with a baton. Um, and one of his students said, Hank knew the game plan so well, he didn't need to look at it. He would often make suggestions. Len Dawson was familiar with the game plan. It wasn't like he was looking through the pages in the third quarter going, what should I call? He knew it all so well. But the one other thing I would say is, and I think you guys can speak to this. Stu Stram said something to his son. He said Hank was obsessed with winning, not competing, winning. And so he would go to almost any ends, whether it was football, racquetball, golf, he would do anything he possibly could because he grew up hard on the streets of Gary, Indiana, and what he learned was athletic excellence was a way to keep him out of the factories. And so that compulsion, that obsession, that almost Ahab and the whale um, level of compulsion was one of the things that made the Chiefs great. One, one thing I want to make sure we focus on, and shortly we'll, we'll see if we can take a few questions from the audience, but one thing pretty notable about that team, amazing about that team, was six Hall of Famers on defense now that uh, Johnny Robinson finally got his due and went in the Hall of Fame over the summer. Um, the other stat that stands out about that defense is that it gave up 20 points total in three postseason games that year. Um, by way of current context, uh, the Chiefs defense against the Patriots in the last playoff game gave up 23 points in the second half. Well, it's actually 20 points. 20? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah he said, and that was. That was, by the way, by, to underscore your point. Six, seven, seven. Right. 20, that was, tw right, 20, 20 points. The 69 Chiefs gave up 20 points in the playoffs, yeah. which you said. I did. <laughs> um, but, but this this Chiefs defense gave up more than that. Yeah. Um, and, and so two points here, and then um, one really is, um, you, you wouldn't get to the Super Bowl without that defense. You, you wouldn't have won the Super Bowl without that defense. Um, what what enabled that to be that good? What it, what it really starts with is that each person has to have their understanding and concept of what excellence means. How do you measure yourself? How are you being measured for others? So if I'm an African American guy, 52 years ago, I come to Kansas City. Other teams do not let people with my color have a chance to play. If I'm trying to impress my teacher, I have to think about what can I do different than other people and maybe cause you to pay attention to me even though you might not want to. So I decided that if I eliminated penalties from the way I play, you have to view me better than the other person has penalties because I won't have any. Now I can get into a whole other discussion of Six Sigma, Lean, Kaizen, Organizational Management, I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> The search in its own way, at that point in time, I had created my own model. So I played 11 years and five penalties. If you play on my defense, you could not have penalties. Word is could not. <laughs> not accepted at all. If you thought you could, you ask the coach to get rid of it. Because you can't win with that. So this came. In January, someone was lined up something called offside. Right? <laughs> Two weeks ago, they played the Texans. They had 10 pills in the first half. Denver, Frank Clark had a face mask, 15 yards. Next third down, another 15 yard penalty. Even when they scored, they had an offside. Can't win with that. So the thing I'm talking to someone over at the organization just to a chat about is look, in January, you lost because there was a penalty. You're six games into the season. How can you continue to have that? Well, obviously, from a management standpoint, you have not designed the structure that causes people to understand what accountability is for the mind to not allow you to, and this is not being about Frank Clark, but I'll make a point. I never had a face mask company. 
At a point, it was never because the mind didn't allow the fingers to clasp. <laughs> Seriously, if you had a, a, a motion, a motion to the element, your fingers wouldn't do that because you had worked that out of your system yeah. that that takes away from your ability to win. I mean, so what happens is that the full accountability is a requirement. And I don't know whether you can get the shift in it now this much into the season, but they have an opportunity for the next two weeks to do something that could be like what they did. Whether they can do it, we'll only show a based on about 10 o'clock tonight. That's a good word. Good word for the accountability. And coaching has some, but of course, he's an individual. He didn't have to be, he had to be coached every day. He had his, and most of us, I think, really, we do the right thing on our own. I still of course, coach, being a leader and a coach to get rid of you and find if you do something wrong. Uh, so we were accountable. We, some people had to be taught to be more accountable, but I think Molly and I were pretty accountable when we got here. Is that George Thomas sitting there? <laughs> Mr. Thomas, would you? Would, would you? Okay. George Thomas. <laughs> John, regular John Speaker. Well, the Brown Speaker during the years that we did what we did, and his skill was viewed as the best equal to all of us. If there were something called the Hall of Fame for groundskeepers, or if there were a Hall of Fame for him and his skill in the history of this league, the man for living legends, right here with the side guys. And you kicked out that field many times. Can you offer it? <laughs> he had done something, but special to the field, he had maybe with some uh, fertilizer on or whatever. So I was out there long kicking, and he sees me and he comes and just yells and screams and kicks me off the field. <laughs> George, what damage could I have done? The next, an hour later, here comes 60, 70 guys that weigh 300 pounds and they run across the field. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he was. He wanted them to have it exactly right. I was scared of George. <laughs> I'll ask one more, and then let's let's see if we can get a couple three from the audience. Um, this may or may not prove to be at all a parallel, but it, it is uh, of interest to me that one of the things that you guys went through to get to that Super Bowl was the loss of your quarterback um, for quite some time. Um, when Lynn Dawson was hurt early in the season and, and then Jackie Lee was hurt the next week and then uh, Mike Livingston came in and went 6-0 uh, as the starter. Um, unproven, had done a, done a regular season, all the regular season game since his um, last year at SMU. Uh, and sat, didn't throw a ball at all in 1968. And now we have Matt Moore playing for the Chiefs that didn't throw a ball at all last season, sat out. And that may be where the parallel ends. Um, but but I but I just wonder what um, what galvanized you? What 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 did you go through and lost uh, such an important part of the team? Well, there, I have a well, well, he's knows more about football than I do still. <laughs> so what what happened defensively? And as I read your article this morning, and read the article to see that in the six games after Livingston became the starter. The defense gave up 71 points. I knew it was in the 12 to 14 range that the defense had understood that with a rookie quarterback, we could not allow points to be scored against us. And points meant the mid teams. Because if it's only mid teams, he has a chance to help us win, to get us back. But if we get above 20, it won't work. The math won't work because the fellow's too young to make it all happen. So what it did was to make us that much better because we had to hold it together till Dawson came back with the experience to take us through the playoffs. Because Ricky couldn't do that either. So it's the same elimination tournament. So it was one that through that next six, seven weeks, we became much, much better at understanding how to play the game. 
how to play every play of the game, how to take all four and a half seconds and make you see something, how not to be doing all the things that you see people do, all the wiggling and the dancing. Oh, I know, you couldn't do that playing the game. You have to understand how the game is played. That's 35 to 40 seconds between plays. Every second you have belongs to me. It does not belong to you. You get ready for the next four and a half seconds to perform. Football is a 48-hour business. It's 48 hours in one day time. If any of you think about your jobs that you have today, imagine if your pay is depending upon 48 hours running time, or you don't have a job next year. And that's running time. The actual time is much less than that because each play takes less than five seconds. So every moment must be dedicated to understanding of how to play the game and how to be part of it. So we were able to form an ability to do that because we had Dawson Alcon, Jack Lee's engine, Larry Sims quarterback, and he figured out how to play the game. Well, we can only hope to see a little of that tonight. Um, <laughs> um, one last thing I just want to add, and we'll take a couple of questions. It, 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 in talking about the big picture here, we, you know, we haven't really had a chance to drill into the unbelievable stories, really, both of, of Willie and Jan and how they came to be here, who they became. And you, you can look, certainly learn more about that in the book. Um, but I, I, I think it's evident uh, the sort of people they are from how they are here on stage with us. So with that, I wonder if there's a couple a couple questions from the audience. Um, sure. I see all the calls being taxed. Appreciate it, I'm sorry. The calls being taxed on the street. You know, I'm talking about the street. Why do we get to go to Taylor in the Hall of Fame? Because that she has one piece I think that's missing. Because I got to go to try to what for your receivers to be And you're looking at stacks and they stack up. So, well, I don't know. 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 Did there ever get a question about getting O's, about getting Coach Taylor in the Hall of Fame, and uh, was rightfully so, and, and uh, perhaps not to happen, alas, after all these years? Uh, it's difficult. I started with this. I've been on the board of trustees for Coach Football Hall of Fame for eight or nine years, so it's like I'm really more than inside than a lot of the others. But what happens is that it's a very difficult task for anybody. And the thing that happens is that as time goes on, even with Johnny Robinson, fortunately, he got in this past year. So for those of us who are trying to compare from period to period, generation to generation, I know one thing that I was able to do about eight or nine years ago, and uh, a number of players in the Hall of Fame, they would ask one or two of us to opine on the senior committee who would look at the senior players and offer our view to the senior decision makers. The thing that you found was how difficult it was when you have so many men across this league who have outstanding skill and ability that would feel as passionate for their team as you feel for your team. And with that being said, it is an extremely tough task to be one of the individuals who ends up in the process of the law. And there's nothing William and I can really do that the process is. There's not anything they can do to really, they can nominate him, and from then on, there's nothing they can do. But see, also, you can nominate him. He has been nominated, but anyone can nominate someone that they feel should be considered for induction in the process of the law. I'll go a step further, I think. I don't think it's going to happen. I think there was, there was a sliver of time when one of those prototype wide receivers from the 60s was going to go in and it wound up being Bob Hayes. And it, it's not just all the things that, that Willie and Jan said, it's also as more offense is added to the game, it becomes harder and harder to compare those numbers. And the Chiefs, for all the innovation that Hank Stram had, did a lot of running. And so one of the issues was, did they fully take advantage of Otis Taylor's skill set? And it's it's sad. I, when I was, uh, when Joe Posnanski was back here, he and I and Ali Gates and some other people tried to, to get some interest, but Pro Football Hall of Fame voters do not like being lobbied. 
they don't want to hear about it. They think they know everything there is to know about football to begin with. And so it's sad, it breaks my heart, but I think it's too late. But also with Marshall on that film, he was the most elegant athlete I think I've ever seen. Can I tell one quick story? I think so, but let me look to a queue in the back of the room. Do we have time for one more question after this, or is this? Yeah, we can take one more question after Michael. I'll be okay. quick. Um, it's a great story that Otis told me. He catches that ball at Tulane Stadium and breaks McBee's tackle. And he's running down the sideline in front of 80,000 people. And everybody's roaring and cheering. And he distinctly hears his mother's voice oh. yelling, that's my baby. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I talked to Otis's ex-wife about that just to confirm it. She said, yes, and you know you're a mama's boy. When you hear, when you hear your mom's voice out of 80,000 people. So, sorry. Um, sure, like, last question, then we'll wrap it up. Did everybody hear the question? No. Just in case it pertains to the sense of camaraderie the AFL team. <clears throat> The last of the AFL teams, and uh, I think the way that uh, Michael got into it in the book was, I'm not sure if you were one of the people there, really, but there were hugs exchanged with Jets players after Super they won Super Bowl three, so that was a little bit of a, a, a point of pride in the league. There was a lot of interest for the American Football League and trying to be equal to the National Football League, but in 68, when the Jets played the Baltimore Colts in Miami, both the captain, the Thomas, and myself were playing in the American Football League All Star game the next week. I'm sure, Young was the Browns that too. So, we had flown into Miami to attend the Super Bowl. And the Jets were staying at the Gulf Ocean Mile Hotel in Fort Lauderdale. So, we went up to the Gulf Ocean Mile in Fort Lauderdale and waited there for their team buses to arrive after the game. They stepped off the bus, saw us standing over there, everyone came over and congratulated each other because they were the first one, obviously, of the American football league teams to be a national league team. So it was very important. It was very important in being able to establish, because the reality of even race, gender, being equal is a most important thing, right? <laughs> and being able to demonstrate that in a very expansive, broad way. Uh, gives you a tremendous amount of confidence, I'm sure, that has led to us being even more uh, understanding of what was going to happen in the next year. I think that's all the time we have. Um, and I really appreciate everybody being here. And we have a hand for this wonderful day. Hey, it's Blair. Hey, we have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Star's award-winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns we have to offer. And it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. For your convenience, your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at $50, unless you tell us to cancel. A lot of subscription services won't tell you that. They'll just sneak it on there. We just told you. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star. Please visit KansasCity.com slash SportsBeatKCOffer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening.